they have sown into it, they have given wisdom, leadership, and they sit as overseers of Coastline Community Church. And so I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to put your hands together and let's honor Pastor Ron Woods as he comes. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be with you. God bless you. Can you help me say thanks to the entire serve team from parking lot, lobby, nursery, preschool, elementary, worship team. You are so blessed. Thank you, Pastor Anthony. I love you. I love your family. And I join him in honoring Pastor Jason and Raina. The mantle of leadership comes with a huge weight and responsibility. And I love the way they carry it with such faith and vision. So one more time for Pastor Jason. I believe there is something very special that is happening among you as a church. I believe that you're in a holy momentum from last night watching what God is doing on Saturday, my first time to be in your Saturday night service having been here many times on Sunday, having been part of this when it was just a thought, just a perhaps, and watching that perhaps move a family from Tennessee to Florida, from a home to a hotel banquet room, another hotel, a school, the church across the campus to this, As I've been worshiping this weekend, I realize just how sacred what God is doing here really is. I can tell you that it is not happening everywhere. That every pastor prays and longs for the day that they are stewarding momentum. You spend so much of your ministry time to, you look to God for momentum but you are stewarding momentum. How do you do that? I call it setting the tone. How do you look to this event? Because let me, let me try and place it by reminding you that the great awakening not only was a move of God that addressed the cultural moment, but it had a generational impact. We are even a result of that great awakening. And I believe that what God is doing right now in you is a response to this cultural moment. And it is gonna have impact for generations to come. Come on, Coastline. Receive that in your heart. To prepare us to steward this holy momentum, I have to remind you that as we honored the Lord by taking communion. We were remembering and giving praise for the ultimate sacrifice. The one who took our place, the one who paid the price that we could not pay, who died the death that we deserved, he stepped in and according to Hebrews, he is that final sacrifice that will never be repeated because it was a perfect sacrifice. Every sacrifice of the Old Testament was acceptable, but not complete. So it provided covering, but not cleansing. But in the one that all sacrifices were pointing toward, the God-man, Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, we find a complete, come on, put your hands together right there complete sacrifice so that our sins are not just covered, but they are cleansed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And and so when I talk to you about stewarding holy momentum, it's still going to require sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice from forgiveness not for it. It is not a sacrifice for salvation. It is a sacrifice 
from salvation. When you think of the word sacrifice, you think about death and that being the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But then Paul comes along in Romans 12, 1, and I'll put it before us, and he challenges us, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. We've just been reminded God's mercy is Jesus Christ. Romans 1 through chapter 11, 11 chapters that clearly extravagantly describe the amazing grace of God through his son, Jesus. So in view of the ultimate sacrifice, we now offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And in offering that living sacrifice, we can see a magnificent stewardship of this sacred move of God, not just for a few weeks, not just for a few months, but a move of God that would not just counter this cultural moment, but be an influence to this cultural moment and for generations to come. This stewardship is over five relationships that Paul talks about in Romans 12. It's God, the world, yourself, the believers, and the unbelievers. Let me put it in front of you in a, in a way that's broken down a little bit more. We offer ourselves to God. We separate from the world and are transformed. We have a sober self-assessment. We don't think of ourselves more highly than we should. It is freedom when you know who you are and who you're not. It is a blessing to not get caught in comparison traps. There is more going on right now to try to get you distracted and trapped in comparison than ever before. But if you steward this relationship, understanding who you are in Jesus, then you walk in the freedom to be who God made you to be, who God saved you to be, to do what God called you to do. You see that these relationships, I've broken them down when it comes to stewarding our relationship with God. It's about worship with ourselves, with the world, with believers, it's discipleship. And with the unbeliever, it is our mission. We love lost people. We seek to reach lost people. And as you see in the Old Testament, when there was an acceptable sacrifice, there was always a divine response. And that divine response was most often fire. The consuming fire of God rested on the sacrifice. And if we will offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, the fire will fall. Let me say it this way. You and I, we can't create the fire. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the fire of leadership, power, guidance. That's empowerment that raises us to a self that's greater than ourselves. It's supernatural. And we can't start that fire. But we can provide the fuel. The fuel is our worship, discipleship, and our mission. It's not all God. If it's all about God and what God is doing doesn't move us with a greater burden for the lost, then we need to check the fire. If what God is doing has me consumed with figuring out who I am, but I'm not serving my brothers and sisters, I need to check the fire. I've been a pastor for 35 years, and I've been a Christian longer than that. I was raised in church. I've seen it all. I've seen people boast of a great move of God, but nobody was sharing their faith. I've seen people boast of a move of God, but there was no surrender to spiritual formation and Christ-likeness. There was no maturity. I have seen people boast of a great move of God, and yet so many ministries of the church 
desperate for more people to serve, but the fire was not showing up in a servant's spirit. So when the fresh fire of God is moving, there will be a stewardship of your relationship with God, your separation from the world to God, understanding who you are, who you're not. You will be serving one another from the zeal that is in your heart, and you will be taking the love of Jesus to the lost and the broken. That is what I'm talking about by sacred, holy momentum. It's how you steward it. I will work with some of these. First of all, to the unbeliever. We have the good news. And this good news is that Jesus did what only Jesus could do. That we stand saved, forgiven, free, walking in peace, walking in power because of Jesus. There was absolutely nothing I brought to the table. The fact that you and I are more than conquerors is because he conquered. You know why I'm a conqueror? Because I didn't conquer a thing. I need some help right there. He did. Help me, somebody. Now nothing can separate me because of what he did. Height or depth, angels or demons, it doesn't because of who he is, because of what he did, because of the death he died, because of his resurrection, I am free. You know, uh, in North Carolina, there's, uh, there's a base where our fighter jets, they go through their, their preparation, and those jets take off very near a very busy road. And if people aren't aware, when those jets, it, it will shock them. So they have a sign, and it says, pardon our noise. It's the sound of freedom. Coastline, come on. How about a little bit of noise in the house? It's the sound of freedom. He saved us. He forgave us. He set us free. He turned us around and established us on a firm foundation. That's what we carry to the lost. It is not product placement. It is the overflow of a life that has been radically changed. What makes your witness and our witness naturally supernatural is because we're not trying to push a product we are carrying the grace the message the good news and this good news with us will never become old news not a chance he's been too good he's done too much and when the fresh fire is falling on the full surrender of the local church there will not be silence we will not allow the culture to privatize our faith. This culture doesn't care that you're in here right now doing what you're doing, but just keep it here. You wanna talk about Jesus? Do it, just do it here. But when you leave, don't think about Jesus, open your Bible or talk about him until you are back here. And when that happens, they privatize our faith. We get segmented, we're just that sect over there in that building with an unusual tax status. The devil is a liar. This is the good news. And we will, come on, we're a city set on a hill. We are a light that cannot be hidden. We will share this. We will not, It God's been too good. And when we take Jesus to the lost, and did, did you hear how I said that? When we take Jesus all my life, I, I've gotten this, this terminology wrong. I'm not taking Jesus anywhere. I'm joining him where he's already working. When you share your faith with somebody, you're not initiating anything. God's already written eternity on their hearts. You're joining him where he's already working. That's good. 
this understanding with fresh fire makes our dispersing as powerful as our gathering. We have had an awesome time today, and we're not even finished. I mean, we'll be here until at least 2, 2.30. And some of you are like, I'm out of here right now. He just lost the fire. <laughs> this is awesome. We've been talking about the atmosphere and change the atmosphere. Do you know what, what happens in this atmosphere is a result of us? We are the atmosphere. We'll walk in. Yes, God is here. He's here because you are here. When you leave, it's just a building. Now, God is everywhere all the time. But when we are aware of his everywhereness, then there can be a manifestation of the presence for this very moment. And I just want to tell you, God's in this moment. And so it becomes this extraordinary gathering. But then we disperse to go join Jesus. You see, it's not an issue if the world is ready. Jesus says the harvest is ready. We just need more laborers. You say, well, the world doesn't look ready. Well, Nathaniel didn't look ready when Philip went and said, hey, come and see the man. The woman of Samaria didn't look ready to have her life. She, did, she didn't go to that, that watering place looking for Jesus. She was there in the middle of the day trying to avoid any contact. She's allowed her lifestyle to isolate her. She's broken, and Jesus went to her. Jesus set the appointment. Jesus changed her life. Jesus says, you keep drinking this water as if you stay in your thought process of what will meet your need. You'll have one dysfunctional, broken relationship after another but if you drink of the water I give it'll well up within you it will change your heart and your entire life and the generations to come so the world she didn't look ready but you see when you are walking in the Holy Spirit you see differently than everybody else you see beyond the veneer of success or brokenness to a heart that needs Jesus. And so because you see differently, you become a laborer in the harvest and just out of the overwhelming grace of God in your life, you are walking in a natural, supernatural witness and then it happens again as it was in the book of Acts. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And you come in here on a Sunday and celebrate the ministry that God's been doing all week long. It's back into that relationship that we have with each other, the believers, the church. One of the most important reminders that I could give, if you're new to the faith, one of the most important teachings is that once you get saved, you are a minister. Everybody that's saved is a minister. Just let that settle. Theologically, Peter in his first letter would call this the priesthood of all believers. He said it like this, you've been brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. A royal priesthood. Royal because it's his blood now flowing through your veins. A priesthood because now the old covenant where there was a priesthood of a few, meaning just a few that could go into the, the very glory of God, and could minister on behalf of God, was blown out by the wind of the Holy Spirit in the upper room, and it ushered in the priesthood of all believers. So now you have direct access to God. You have 
the same access to God as any Christian, as any pastor. And so the credential to, it, to come boldly to the throne is salvation. The credential to then go and serve Jesus is the fact that you are a believer. You have come into this place and we've done of what is of first importance. We offer a sacrifice to God of praise. My number one responsibility and priority as a believer and for us as a church is to worship God. First and foremost, but once as a kingdom of priests that we've worshiped God, now we go and serve others. We minister to God, and then we minister to others. You have given glory to God today by engaging your heart, lifting your voice, lifting your hands, clapping your hands. This is worship. But worship then continues through the gift he's given you. The talent or talents. And through those giftings, you deploy them by giving of your time through the ministry of the local church so that the kingdom is advanced. And as this church grows, and it's growing rapidly, so the demand and the responsibility. And over church history, sadly, it's been a small percentage doing the majority of the work. We used to hear these things, that it's 20% that do 80% of the serving, the giving, and the eating. <laughs> well, you have way more than 20%. Our church has way more than 20%, but I have to tell you that in my church, there are many ministries that need more people serving. I've been close enough to this team to know that there are ministries that need more people serving. And in the brilliant plan of God is that when we get saved, we don't get saved to sit. We turn from idols to God to serve. And those in the nursery serving your babies are worshiping. Those that are with the preschool, kid, they're giving worship through their heart, through their talent. Those on this, whoo, I'm feeling something today at the, at the 11 o'clock. You are the worship team. This group up here, they have been given talents like the Levites who came and they come and facilitate. But you're a minister. And what was the first responsibility of the minister? To worship God. And now we go and find a place to serve. I want Coastline to be the first church where Pastor Jason and the pastoral team say, we have so many people wanting to serve, we're creating opportunity. And until that's happening, we still have some stewardship. Until that's happening, we're not living up to the opportunity of stewarding holy momentum. When I drove up early this morning and that parking attendant was putting on that yellow raincoat out there in the rain parking cars, he was giving worship like this team up here today. Put a clap offering right there. Come on, New Testament church. Come on, Team Coastline. Let's be involved advancing the kingdom. That's the stewardship. See, never lack, look at the word, never lacking in zeal. Got to tell the story. There was a time our church was growing so fast. And we had this preschool class, all these kids. We didn't have enough people. I'd stood there and preached it, announced it. Finally, i just go get a kid out of preschool. Bring him and say, this is little Johnny. Little Johnny wants to know about Jesus. But he doesn't have anyone to tell him. So little Johnny and all his friends are just back there hurting each other. Because there's, you know, it's like, like, it was desperate. And do you know what happens usually in a moment like that? Some God, some God-honoring, willing person who doesn't even like kids but loves God says, I'll do it. 
Nobody else will do it. I'll do it. Now Johnny has a leader, but the leader doesn't really like kids, and so it's obvious, and so now Johnny has an endurance contest, and so does the leader. <laughs> and Johnny says to his parents, please don't take me back there, and that leader says, dear God, when will this tour of duty ever end? <laughs> when the grand plan of God is that somebody has a passion for kids and the gifting to match. And when... When that person with the gift and the passion matches in the right person in the right place, everybody grows. Now little Johnny says, take me back there every single week. The leader says, it's hard, but it's so rewarding. Come on, Team Coastline. That's what the vision is. I'll go back to that first one. We're hurrying. It's the relationship we have with God. I'm not going to do all five. This relationship we have with God, it's where, like Paul said, we set apart Christ as the Lord of our hearts. Peter said, your heart is like a throne and it only belongs to Jesus. This is where we draw near to God because he's drawing near to us. We offer ourselves a living sacrifice to God. Imagine two people walking that main road and they look over this morning and see all the cars and one says to the other, what are, what are all of those cars parked in those parking? What's that about? And the other person says, well, I know. All those people in there, they believe that his loving kindness is better than life. They can't imagine where they would be without him. They can't even count the blessings. The shepherd of their valleys, the God of their mountains. The God who never slumbers nor sleeps, watches over them and keeps them. The one who watches over them with singing. When they wake up at two in the morning, he's there. When they show up here at 11, He's there. Those people are in there because they believe that his loving kindness is better than life. That person would go on to say, here's another way to describe why they are all there. They, they believe that they're hosting the king. If Jesus walked from backstage, just in physical form, just walked out here right now, would anything about us change? And by the word of the Lord, he is here. You're hosting right now the presence of God. And it should invoke an awe-inspired respect. We are in the glory of his presence. That God, very God, would choose to dwell among the praises of his people. That God who created you, who created the world, the galaxy and galaxies, would be in this place. And yes, he's here because he's everywhere. And yes, he's at my church in Oklahoma today because he's everywhere, but that he would be here in a unique way, very differently than in Oklahoma because we're not there and we're not those people. Even differently than he was here last night or at nine o'clock because this is not those gatherings. And God is that personal and that specific. So someone sitting over here will leave and say, it was like I was the only person in the room. It was like God was talking to me. And someone over here will say, it was as though I was the only person in the room. Something captured my heart. It was the presence of God. It was like, it was like that preacher's been listening in to my conversation. That's no preacher listening in. That's the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the grace of God, the power of God, that would call you friends. And so we have that magnificent 
of a Savior that right now we are hosting the presence of a king. Imagine this center aisle and we're ready. The wedding party is up here and the bride is about to enter and be ushered down the center aisle to meet her groom. It's a glorious, magnificent moment. All that has led to that moment. Can you imagine as the bride enters and the music's playing and the groom is overwhelmed, here comes his bride. What if that bride reached for her phone, looked at her father, says, look at that. They're having tacos. <laughs> I, I, this is your groom. You're his bride. You would never see that. You see just the opposite, total focus, yes. the magnitude, the weight of the moment, the love, the power, the sovereignty. In that moment, we are in the presence. We're the bride of Christ. Yes. Yes. Help me, church. We will not be distracted. We will not drift in our focus. We will give him our whole heart. And out of that kind of overwhelming power through our relationship with Jesus is that final one I talk about today. And worship team, you can come. It's where I'm not conformed to the pattern of this world, but I'm transformed. And the full power and motivation to not be conformed, the consecration and then the sanctification, the separation is not because of a rigid religious observance. It is out of this relationship with the groom. It's out of this relationship with King Jesus, Savior Jesus, healer, deliverer, my best friend. Out of that relationship, I, I come with what's called glad surrender. You see, I remember where he found me, as do you. Realize the world has nothing to offer us. It offers everything and gives nothing in return. And you know what it is to go and invest yourself in what the world offers. And the next time you have to give more just to return with less of yourself. And you're in this vicious cycle that seems right, but it's destructive. And so here comes Jesus and to a culture that wants to say that the exclusive claim of scripture, which is that Jesus is the only one given to save and who can save. And now a culture that is trying to say that's narrow, that's mean, that's bigoted, that is culture trying to privatize the one and only hope for all humanity. For in fact, it's the most loving because nothing in this world could fix the brokenness of humanity. Nothing in this world could heal the broken heart, set the captive free. Nothing in this world could break the guilt and lift the shame. But here comes the one, the forever sacrificed Jesus Christ who willingly died hanging on a cross that he had the power to come off of, but willingly yielded his life. Nobody took his life. He gave his life. So he is the one who was found worthy and able. So it is his name. Thank God for the name. Thank God for the person and the work of Jesus. It's his name given whereby your life can be radically forever changed. Oh, I, I, my daughter, she's at home preaching in my place today. My youngest son is the worship pastor of the church in Northern Virginia. My oldest son is the drummer and the music director and works there in Northern Virginia. They're all doing ministry. 
And my daughter today, she's talking about David and Goliath. She talks about the valley, the hill, the giant. The Israeli soldiers, David's brothers, all unwilling to fight. David shows up and David goes to fight. She's preaching about how, you know, we often see ourselves in David. And she's like, she got it. She, she, she got the context. She said, we're not David. David is pointing to a greater David. A greater David, Jesus Christ, who would take on our giants that on our best day we could not slay. It wasn't a soldier, it was a shepherd. Shepherd boy David coming off the backfield saying, I just know when the lion and the bear attack the sheep, God, God, God would give me power. I'm gonna take this giant. And he released the stone from a distance and it hit Goliath. They're probably the only place there was no armor right there. And as you know, he used Goliath's sword and cut off his head, made a show of him openly taking his head to the highest place in Jerusalem. Track forward with me. Jesus is taken to the highest place, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there he is nailed to the cross. And as he's being nailed to the cross, he is making a show openly of every demon and the devil, of death and hell, of sin, of struggle, of Satan, he conquered, and that's why we are more than conquerors. It was a shepherd, it wasn't me, it wasn't me going out on the battlefield, it was Jesus who walked out on the battlefield and slayed the giant. Woo. So we I said, hey, let's fight, and whoever wins, if you win, we'll be your slaves. Did that happen? No. Because sin doesn't want to ever give up. So it took a shepherd who was also a king, who was also a priest, who was also a lamb. And he became the sacrifice. I came to say like that sacrifice would you stand with me like that sacrifice on Mount Carmel Elijah had prepared it there were all these people defying God they would serve the God who answered by fire Elijah prayed the fire fell and many in the valley of decision turned their heart to God God is saying Offer yourself, Coastline, as a living sacrifice. And you will be the fire, the force of clarity in a culture of confusion. Like Isaiah in the temple on the Lord's day, the glory of God filled that temple. He repented and fire touched his heart. God said, who's going to take this message? Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Because when the fire falls, you have the force and the motivation to be about God-honoring destiny. Coastline, God has a destiny. Say yes. Say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me to serve in the nursery. Send me to the parking lot. Send me to elementary. Send me to the worship team. Send me. Send me to my neighbors, my co-workers, my classmates. Here. Finally, 120 get in an upper room in full surrender. The upper room was nothing more than an altar. And when they placed themselves as a sacrifice, the fire. Tongues of fire set upon each of them. And they bolted out of that upper room a living sacrifice. They turned their world upside down. They had no money. They had no political clout. They had no military. They had the power of the fire of the Holy Spirit, and they turned the world. And that fire never went out. May the fire of Coastline Community Church never 
go out. May it revolutionize this region until people are lined up to get in the house. Give him the greatest praise. Yes. Come right in to change the atmosphere. Come on, sing this, everybody. Change the atmosphere. Take my doubt and fear Cause you are holy You are holy And with your spirit in Faith is rising here in this place Cause you are holy yeah. And you yeah. are holy With every hand lifted Thank you. 